Uh, just to follow then up on, on uh, again on this uh, uh, this passage here, um, no matter how, um, the now of writing, the writer maintaining or uh, grasping with one hand his ballpoint pen, yet no matter how fine this point may be, it's like the stigma of every mark already split. There's a reference here to a very, very interesting essay of Derrida's. Uh, around the word stigma, which I can only recommend to you. It's, in, it's called uh, Grame and Usia, Note on a Note of Being and Time. And it's reprinted in his book called Margins of Philosophy. And in it, what he does is to criticize uh, Heidegger and def in, a, in a strange way to defend Aristotle against the critique that Heidegger develops. Heidegger, at the end of being, being in time, one of the main aspects of being in time is to criticize the sense of time of the traditional metaphysical tradition as being based on a notion of being as entities, as things that are already there, and not as a kind of process. It's much more elusive than that. And uh, the argument that, that Heidegger makes is that the notion of time that metaphysics developed furnished a kind of infrastructure for this reduction of being to entity. And the, 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 the infrastructure was built around a privileging of time around the idea of the now, the present now, so that the three dimensions of time, past, present, and future, are seen as subsets of the, 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 of the present now. In other words, the past is the now that no longer is, it's been, and the, the future is the now that's not yet come. And so that they're all moduli of now, and, and uh, he traces this back, to, among other things, to Aristotle. And he does a critique of Aristotle, claiming that Aristotle has uh, a basically sort of reified notion of time as now. Derrida, in this article, goes back to the text of Aristotle and tries to argue that Aristotle's notion of time, of the now, is much more sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, than Heidegger allows. And uh, above all that, it is relational and that implies a kind of concomitance or simultaneity that disrupts the notion of a, of a, of a, of a self-identical self now uh, through a notion of simultaneity. And he, he's working with the Greek text there, so the word, he, the word he, he concentrates on in Greek is the little word ama, which means at once, at the same time. And uh, one of the points he uses there is the notion of the stigma, which apparently also comes out again. It's been a long time since I read this essay. The stigma, which of course related to stigmata and so on, point in Greek. And he's trying to argue that the point involves not something that's self-identical, but an interruption, uh, a rupture, you see. Something like a, divisible, a division and so on. And that's what he's referring to here. Uh, it's like the stigma of every mark already split. So I'm just giving you a kind of you know resume of that very very interesting you know dense article where you, it's very also interesting to see how he works with Heidegger because on the one hand he's he's taking up the impulse from Heidegger to criticize a certain notion of the now but he's trying to show how the you know Heidegger is short circuiting and and and, and uh, making it too easy for himself and that already in the tradition you find uh, resources that go beyond what some of the critics, so, you know, anybody who thinks that, 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 that Derrida's approach to the philosophical tradition is strictly negative, you know, he, he knows it better uh, in some sense, uh, you know, misses the point that he really sees it as a, as a co complex resource that's been reduced to a certain way. Heidegger will speak about the position, the tradition as though it were relatively monolithic. So, you know, for Heidegger, the big division becomes before Plato, pre-Platonic, uh, the pre-Socratics. And then, and then Heidegger and so on. Whereas Derrida will say, it's going on, it's in the tradition itself. That's a very different approach. Uh, but it's also very fundamental because everything he's saying about the mark applies to texts, to proper names, to thinkers, saying that there's always the possibility of complexities, of things doing much more than what they seem to be doing. So the deconstruction, uh, as he practices, it shouldn't be seen just as a kind of one-upsmanship. You know, in that sense, it's not criticism and saying, you know, uh, uh, Aristotle thought he was doing this, but I know better, or Husserl and so on, but rather that in the text there are various tendencies pulling in different directions. And if you read it, you can read in a certain way that open up that text to a different reading. So that I think the, the, the sense is when you read Derrida, you should be eager to go back and look at those texts, not saying, you don't have to read Plato anymore because he's a metaphysician. 
Yeah, I, it's funny because when, when we were first uh, in the 70s, when Derrida was becoming known in the States, mainly in literature departments, there were many people who said, you know, we don't have to worry about philosophy, philosophical texts, you know, because it's all metaphysical and so on. There was this really, and I think that, you know, that I think in the meanwhile, it should be fairly clear that that's not, you know, not what he's doing. And that's why even in the later texts, like in Rogues, uh, it's not even... His interest is not even deconstructionist in the sense of saying Plato wanted this, but in fact you can do something else. Rather, he goes back to Plato to find a description of democracy as a kind of multiple, many-colored uh, chaos in some ways that he finds in and of itself very suggestive. He doesn't really care, you know, whether Plato, you know, Plato then uh, condemns it that's there or doesn't or something like that. But in fact, he's interested more in what's going on rather than in disproving a certain intention or something like that. See, that's the more. That's why it's not criticism in that sense. It's going back to re, uh, rework and draw out of the tradition resources that have been <coughs> neglected for various reasons. You know, uh, 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 there. Um, so that, and then uh, just the, 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 actually the next sentence is what I really wanted to point to. Uh, no matter how fine this point may be, it is like the stigma of every mark already split. The sender of the shopping list is not the same as the receiver, even if they bear the same name and are endowed with the identity of a single ego. This could be really a kind of epigraph of some of the stuff that I'm trying to work on. In other words, a single ego uh, does not necessarily mean a monolithic. Uh, identity of the elements that compose it. So then the problem, you know, what, what is it that constitutes the singularity of a single ego? See, how do we rethink? And for here, for this, Nietzsche is helpful and, and lots of other thinkers as, as well there. I mean, Nietzsche say, uh, saying that the, the self is related to the body, is related to a kind of self-overcoming and transformation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of that. And, and for Derrida also, the, 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 the bodily dimension is crucial, uh, keeps why bodily? Uh, because the bodily dimension is what partially what singularizes an existence. You see, the body is always localized; it's always in a relatively singular place in time and space, and so on. And and uh, uh, that has to be taken into you know into into account there. And so, and th I think this is something which he takes relative, you know quite seriously, uh, so that, for example, when he writes his book on Freud in the postcard, you know, part of this book, there's a book called The Postcard that he writes, and part of that is a, a section on Freud. The first part of a series of letters that seem to be, you don't know whether they're fictional or non-fictional or half-fictional, that he's writing. Uh, and the second part is a, is a reading of Freud's uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And uh, one of the things he does in that is to, is to uh, raise the question of how Freud is making a name for himself apart from his uh, uh, proper name. In other words, he's, he's establishing something called psychoanalysis, not Freud Freudism or something like that, not like Marxism or, or anything like that, but that nevertheless is related in, a, in some sort of an essential way to the founder of and so uh, one of the things he does, uh, very interesting there, is to say, you know, Freud in Beyond the Pleasure Principle is basically overthrowing all the, the basic ideas that up to then seemed to hold the whole system together, namely the pleasure principle. Say, you know, up to now we believed this, and, 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 and now we have to you know, uh, rethink this all, because there are too many instances where it's clear that pleasure is not the driving, is not the driving force. And um, at the end of that essay, it was very, Freud says, after he's introduced the death drive and so on, which he knows is not verifiable or as, you know, in a laboratory and so on, he says, Freud says, the reader may ask me, how much do I myself really believe? How much am I convinced by what I've been saying here, particularly since it's so speculative, all of this stuff and so on. And Freud says, in such cases, my belief doesn't matter. Because it wouldn't, what difference would it mean if I, if, what would that say if I would, uh, it's a very complicated strategy. And, and then, so Derrida interprets that in a very, in a way that has a lot to do with his own, right? This is all a kind of, the second part on Freud is as autobiographical as the first part, which is obviously 
has an autobiographical element. And he says, you know, he says, when somebody like Freud, when an author withdraws and says, don't ask me if what I'm saying, you know, is a, he says he can impose his authority even more on his readers than if you were to say, look, I believe this, or I, you know, because then you identify him and you can position it. But there he's like the absent God. And he says, it's up to you, you know, you, you, I don't know whether, uh, and he says, this is a strategy of Freud to impose a certain authority in, 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 in withdrawing. And there's something very similar going on in Derrida's work. I'm supposed to give a, a paper at a conference in Winnipeg uh, in October on Freud after Derrida or something like that. And I'm going to try to work on this, on, 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 on this. This is, yeah, but not just in the question of Derrida as individual connected to Freud, but as a question of this idea of, you know, what, how do you think of a single ego that is uh, intrinsically divided and nevertheless uh, in some way presents itself as sane? Rethinking the question of the self. I mean, this is for me an open, you know, interesting issue. Yeah. To me, it actually reflects the, the Catholic tradition quite well because, you know, be it Jesus or be it a priest yeah. or be it whoever, it is sort of, it is a person who is, who is representational yeah. Um, and sort of abstract concept, mm -hmm. which you know can dictate all sorts of authority, and yet you know when it really comes down to it, oh well, I'm not, I'm not the real authority. The authority's up here, right? right. So it's, it's, that actually fits into the Catholic tradition quite nicely. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's true. The ambiguity of except that, you know except that what he's doing here, Derrida, is is in a certain sense also Protestant in questioning. The status of representation. You see, uh, there. This this notion of divisibility strikes me as you know uh, something that that uh, we only have representations. That's true, but the validity, the reliability of the representation as something that's intrinsically divisible, as it were, it doesn't uh, you know isn't isn't can't be taken for granted. The so the problem is how do you how does a, an authority can it. Is there an authority that reconstitutes itself in this uh, deconstruction of representation? And that's why I, that's why I find the whole you know, post-Reformation issue so interesting. As long as you have a reformational authority, and, but when you have, in other words, Luther coming along and saying, it's not the glory, it's not the, the, any, any sign that can be created by the Catholic Church, it's the cross you know, that you have to think about. You know, what, what does that mean? What do you do with that? See, uh, uh, the cross in relation to life and death, and really, it's not the priest then who can tell you what that cross, no, only you. Yeah. So that really, you know, aggravates uh, in a way uh, and heightens the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, issue there. Um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting in, in, in respect to what you're saying. There's this uh, book of, uh, um, of Carl Schmidt very short book called Roman Catholicism and Political Form. It's also been translated into English, which is really a lecture he gave, but it's about like 80 pages and so on, where he's talking in the mid-20s. Uh, uh, Schmidt, who's a committed Catholic, but also an unusual Catholic, not at all a, you know, uh, he, there were lots of things. He was, for example, he, he uh, was excommunicated. Why? Because he remarried. He divorced his wife and remarried. And he tried to get a special dispensation from the church to have his marriage, and the first marriage, annulled. So, and they, they, they didn't get it. Although he was an extremely prominent uh, legal and, and political in the 20s already, and, and, you know, and an avowed Catholic thinker, a very passionately Catholic thinker. So, but he's, so he was a very unusual. So he writes this uh, book or this lecture called The Roman Catholicism and Political Form, and what he says, he says that the, the, the political role of the church should never be direct, but it is indirect through what he calls the principle of representation. He says the church embodies a, a relation of representation, and he precisely points to the cross, the, to the crucifixion, but in a positive way, not, not I think, in the way Luther, uh, it, or complicated, in a complicated way, because Schmidt is also... Uh, he's a very uh, engaged Catholic and, a, and, a, and a, a deliberately Catholic thinker who sees, for example, the, the, the state as a kind of heir of the Catholic Church, as a problematic heir, but as an heir of the Catholic Church. And he tries to say that the concepts of modern political 
uh, theory are all derived from theological <coughs> concepts. So uh, the most important being the miracle uh, being transformed into the, uh, the sovereign who is both above the law and of the law. The sovereign, that's his main idea, that the sovereignty of a, a political sovereignty manifests itself in the ability to suspend the law in order to preserve the law, in order to transcend the law, in order to make the law applicable in this world. And he says that's, that is something that can never be justified. It principally is like a miracle. So anyway, in this, uh, uh, but he, uh, in this uh, essay, he talks about the principle of representation as being that which uh, uh, basically links the Catholic theology to the functioning of law in a modern political <coughs> system, because law also for him involves a kind of miraculous, discontinuous application of the general to the particular. You see, mm -hmm. so that uh, it's always uh, and his argument there with liberal uh, uh, p political theorists who say that you know democracy is the rule of law and who see no no structural problem in in, in the application of law. Schmidt from very early on says, law can only be applied, law, there is no law that isn't apply, applicable. And law has to be applied by force, but also it has to be able to link itself to singular cases. It has to be able to take the singular cases that I'm applicable to this. And he says that is something that the, the rule of law itself can't guarantee. This leap, so he, and in that sense, he's a reader of Kierkegaard. And he even quotes Kierkegaard at the beginning of one of his other books called Political Theology uh, about how uh, the exception is that which, which uh, takes precedence over the rule. And uh, 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 since I'm talking about Schmidt, Schmidt, by the way, is very important for Agamben, who both criticizes him and learns a lot from him, as well as for Benjamin. Uh, and uh, the idea there, see, it boils down, for me at least, to this awareness of the problematic relation of the singular to the universal. And in that sense, Schmidt is, the, is the, one of the quintessential, quintessential embodiments of what Walter Benjamin calls the counter-reformation. And which he doesn't just limit to Catholicism, but what he says is, is uh, the, uh, the, the, the need of any constituted authority after the Reformation to uh, defend the, its relation of, of imposing its authority on singular cases. Before that could be taken for granted. You see, that's, but after the Reformation, whether no matter where you're coming from, you have that has to be seen as a problem. And uh, Sch uh, Schmidt's argument there is that this problem uh, is never intrinsically realizable. It's, it's, it has to be. Uh, uh, it happens all the time. He says, if you want to understand how a political entity works, you have to look at the way in which it deals with the state of exception. You know, all of Agamben's state of exception. You know, a very interesting book derives from that, uh, uh, from Schmidt, because he says that the only way you can evaluate a legal system is to see how it functions dealing with those cases which can't be immediately brought under it. So it's the state, it's not the state of emergency. It's very close to that. The state of emergency can be understood as an objective situation. You know, there's a, uh, an army is threatening a country. It could be a, a purely external threat to a political entity. But the state of exception is, is defined internally in terms of the, rule, the rules which uh, depend on, which are related to the exception. It's the exception that tests, as it were, the, the viability of the rules. So that the so-called rule of law depends on the executive ability to uh, uh, basically uh, suspend the rule of law where, in face of exceptional circumstances and to function as what's a, a kind of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, his notion of dictatorship there was not absolute. He called it commissarial. It's supposed to be a temporary means in order to allow law to function. But it's, it's what Derrida would call structural possibility. It's implied in the, in the law, is implied in the fundamental disjunct with its application. Uh, it, this all goes back to an early text he writes, which is called, uh, if I remember right, uh, uh, Experience and Judgment or something like that. Uh, and the, the word in, ger in German for judgment, urteil, also means verdict. 
It's the same word for judgment in a, in a, in a, in a logical sense, philosophical, and for f verdict, is ur urteil. And uh, the, he, uh, he, he, he has a kind of Humean argument and question there where he says, is there an intrinsical principle on which judges apply laws to cases or uh, in juridical practice, or is it from just ad hoc? And he comes up with a kind of, at that point, with a Humean answer. He says that if he studies a certain number of cases and he comes to the conclusion that <laughs> judges are led by precedent, mm -hmm. but that there's no guarantee that precedent you know, is intrinsically uh, valid. And above all, as we've seen it, in regard to Constitution, there are conflicting precedents. So the, the idea of precedent doesn't really resolve it. So uh, already in that early, very early, it's, I think it's his PhD thesis, he says that there is really no intrinsic process by which a universal, a general law, which can't be ad hominem or you know, has, to, has to be general, uh, fulfills itself legally by uh, uh, guaranteeing its own applicability. The applicability requires an intervention from the outside. You see, and that's where power and all kinds of other things, you know, come in, into the picture. So, and uh, Schmidt is the example, therefore, of the uh, Benjamin's Counter Reformation because he takes extremely seriously Kierkegaard's very Protestant thinking that the rule depends on the exception rather than the other way, you know, the other way around. There, okay. yeah. There's a nice tie off of that in Agamben's The State of Exception. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mentioned, I, I thought I mentioned that. Yeah, uh, the whole state of exception is, is, is derived from that. Uh, what's very, one of the nice things, you know, like some of the most interesting things in Agamben, I think it's in that book, are these little, you know, uh, bold faced set in those. He has a whole thing about this in, in regard to Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And the, you, know, you really learn something about American history where it's not called, I think, the state of exception. It's called the state of siege or the state of something, but where you know the, 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 you have the executive basically suspending the, the Constitution. And his, uh, Schmidt's argument is that this is a structural necessity of law. You see, because law is only law when it applies itself. But law, as its general uh, maxims, cannot contain the mechanism of its own applicability. And there are, you know, we think of that, sure, you say, okay, the law needs the police, it needs force. Yes, but the reason it needs the police and force is that one of the reasons is that it does not contain the singular within itself and yet must relate to the singular. And so there are various ways you know, that can be interpreted. And for Schmidt, it's interpreted as, as something akin to a divine intervention, external. An external. That's why for Schmidt, you can't derive sovereignty from the will of the people. The will of the because, because a people is not a people unless there's a collective for Schmidt. The collective is held together by law, but law is not held together by anything internal to the people. See, uh, uh, this I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying this is his, his argument, and it's been very criticized. But it's, it, it is quite quite fascinating. Schmidt is a fascinating thinker. The other major argument, though, I have to sort of call it a a morning. The other major argument he makes, which is very, very interesting and very uh, all too applicable today, is that the, a book called The Concept of the Political, he says, the, the concept of the, the, the formation of a political unity is based on what he calls the friend-enemy grouping. It's only when you've identified enemies that that is a group outside the, the, the polity in some sense, even if they're internal, uh, that you have the force to hold together a political a political union. Unfortunately, these days, you know, as a theory, hopefully there's a lot of criticism to be made of that. But as a as a description of, of, of events, it's all too applicable. You know, you want to sort of hold something together, you find the enemy to to uh, to, uh, and that can be the internal enemy or the external enemy. But the, uh, the enemy is, in some sense, uh, he he says it has to be the public enemy. It's not a private enemy. A public enemy. But that's what constitutes the public. There's no internal public without there being the external enemy there. Uh, so you see, it's sort of analogous to the state of exception constituting the rule of, the, the rule of law. It's always the, the relation to the external that, that bounces back and creates the internal there. And you have a, a long, very, very interesting critique of all of this in Derrida's uh, Politics of Friendship, but also in Agamben's State of Exception. And, and also in Benjamin, I think, implicitly in uh, a critique of violence. 
a Benjamin who was very influenced by Schmidt, but also certainly uh, critical in, in, in lots of in, Schmidt has been uh, largely discredited himself because uh, he was a he was a conservative Catholic in the twenties, and then when Hitler took power, he became a Nazi, and like many people, probably in part Heidegger, uh, he thought he could use this as a way of you know uh, of uh, uh, what he, uh, of, of, of implementing certain things because what he, he and others uh, what fascinated them in the Nazi seizure of power and that's all too easily forgotten today is the anti-bourgeois element of it. You have to remember that fascism didn't just descend from some, you know, some idiot bunch of bad guys but in fact grew out of an internal you know, structural crisis of uh, capitalism. We had all the unemployed and debt and so on and so forth, and that it had a strong anti-bourgeois, in that sense, it looked like a revolutionary, called themselves revolutionaries. Many of them were former revolutionaries, Mussolini was a former socialist and so on. And, and, uh, it ha it, it, and so uh, people like Schmidt, who was also conservative, but in, a radical conservative in many ways, and Heidegger in other ways, you know, thought, well, maybe this is a possibility for a real change taking place. The difference was that Heidegger withdrew, at least formally, he didn't give up his party card, but he withdrew from public life uh, very quickly after a year or so. Uh, and Schmidt remained as a political, as a jurist, he remained relatively active, uh, he was, but he was also very much attacked by uh, the official Nazi idea. So that's probably what saved his head at the end of the war. That he, had, you know, he, uh, But he did a lot of very nasty things. He became explicitly anti-Semitic after during the Nazi period, which he hadn't been explicitly before. And it's what makes it, again, uh, you know, sort of uh, his reception afterwards is always, you know, in connection with this. But he is a fascinating uh, thinker and a very, very brilliant writer. Uh, you just have to read a couple of pages of him to be, in a way, I think, captivated by his writing style. He's a great, great writer. On page, on page 53, there's also, it's obviously an important, important section. I'm not sure how uh, repetitive it is and, or how uh, how illuminating it is for you, but again, it's the, the this emphasis of the iterability uh, splitting the individual element uh, in order to allow it to function as a as a mark. And uh, th th there's one reference there that I think is interesting uh, in the middle of the page, middle of that first paragraph, um, where he says it's because this iterability is. Uh, the iterability of an element divides its own identity a priori, even without taking into account the fact that this identity can only determine or delimit itself through differential relations to other elements, and, and that it hence bears the mark of this difference. That seems to me to be a gesture towards socio. In other words, what he's saying here is that his notion of iterability is in some sense prior to the Saussurean notion that signifiers, in order to signify, have to be discriminated uh, from other signifiers like flammable, inflammable, uh, etc. And here it seems to be that in order to recognize, even in order for something to be constituted as a mark, uh, it already has to be different from itself. So uh, the, the important thing is there not to, not to limit the, 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 the role of difference there to the interval between already constituted signifier or given signifiers, but that which allows a signifier to be given as a mark. Uh, there, so he says it's not. It's because this iterability is is differential within each individual element, as well as between the elements, because it splits each each element while constituting it. And note there the the present <coughs> participle. I think because it marks it with an articulatory break, that the remainder, although indispensable, is never that of a full or fulfilling presence. It's a differential structure escaping the logic of presence or the simpler dialectical opposition of presence and absence, upon which opposition the idea of permanence uh, depends. In other words, uh, uh, the whole, this whole discussion is a way of distinguishing his conception of, of, of writing from the more traditional one in the Latin, uh, uh, articulated in the Latin phrase, scripta manent, that is, uh, writings, writings remain. In other words, writing is permanent. And his, uh, his idea is that that notion of permanence presupposes a notion of presence that, that the, the iterability of the mark already, in a way, uh, excludes. Or, or, uh, so what you're, what you're left is, with, in place of what is normally considered uh, writing, is what he calls uh, a leftover, a remainder. Uh, a trace is another way he puts it. In other words, 
if the if if the, that means that if the mark constitutes whatever it is as a mark by reference to being split, then what appears has to be seen as an epiphenomenon in some sense, as a remainder, something that's left over uh, with respect, respect to a process of divisibility or of division that uh, one has to be uh, aware of so that you're never dealing with something that it's not either present or absent, it's something that is left over. So uh, just a, a, it's an alternative there. Uh, the mark is neither present nor absent, that, that this is what is remarkable about it, even if it's not remarked there. And a little bit further down, uh, the break intervenes from the moment that there is a mark at once. It's not negative, but rather the positive condition of the emergence of the mark. It's iterability itself, that which is remarkable in the mark, passing between the re of the repeated and the re of the repeating the re of the repeated and the read of the repeating, traversing and transforming repetition. You see, that's his version of the Saussurian signifier and signified. Uh, only in English we're able to get the present participle in there more easily than with Saussure. In other words, just think if you were, uh, as soon as you say that, that language for Saussure is constituted by signifying and signified, you see that there's a fundamental dissymmetry. That's not a parallel. That's not just one as opposed to the other. The signified is something that's constituted. Signifying is a process. See, uh, It's a process. That means any identification of it comes after, is, relation, is, is related to this ongoing repetitive uh, uh, ING uh, 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 process there. And that's what he's, I think, what we're getting here. The, the, between the re of the repeated and the re of the repeating, traversing, transforming repetition. It's also sort of interesting that uh, a lot of certain uses of, uh, of the ING in English uh, are connected often with, with, with horror or terror. I'm thinking of uh, Kubrick's The Shining, for example, which also has, you know, <coughs> writing and uh, all work, what is it? All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, yeah. and, 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 and so on. So there's lots of repetition in, 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 there, in there as well and so on. I mean, um, just one little caveat with that. We're working with different languages here, so things that take the ing ending in English when you translate it will not necessarily in, 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 in German or in French or in other languages. So it's not, this is not a kind of water map, but there, I think what is being described there can be perhaps found in other, in other languages there. You see? I mean, my translation of Heidegger, for instance, Heidegger's famous book, usually translated as being and time uh, would be uh, to be and 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 time because the the the, uh, the, the infinitive in German is it's sign it's the to be and it's you, you get into all kinds of it's, it's very interesting in relation to Heidegger because if you work a little bit with Heidegger Heidegger's main point is to try to distinguish in German what he calls sein the infinitive from sein den which are usually translate as entities, except it shouldn't be translated as entities. So the normal tra translation would be beings, something that you can identify some there. But the problem, and the way they, they do it in English then is to capitalize the being and, and write small being. But uh, that's very artificial. It doesn't correspond to any ordinary English <coughs> usage. And so it really gums up uh, the, the difference that Heidegger is trying to work out there. Whereas if you were to translate it to be and being, I think you would get closer to it because the to be is something that needs to be concretized in being, but that is not, it can't be reduced to being. And it also has, it's also interesting, it has in English a futural <laughs> element that it doesn't have in German. And that's a case of where uh, a translation can, which is not, which brings in something that isn't in the original, it may also bring in an interesting point because, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, that may relate ultimately to what Heidegger is, taught, is speaking about, even though it doesn't, it's not in the word itself in German. You know what I mean? that, that would take a lot of arguing to, 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 to argue about, but uh, I still would, uh, I think there's something to, uh, to, uh, um, you know, to, uh, to that there. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, 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 so in other words, the inf pardon me? Sorry, do we consider the English translation then closer to what Heidegger was actually trying to say in terms of 
it, it's, it's very complicated. I think that uh, in my, uh, my take on it, it, Heidegger says there is a difference, but although you can't separate them, you can't regard them as, as separated. Zion requires Zion, then, but it can't be reduced to or strictly thought on the basis of, let's say, concrete entities uh, that are present and so on, and, and there. So then the question is how they you know, relate to each other. And uh, my, my sense there is that the, the, um, the, the English being, small b, both condenses and in a way expresses the relationship that he's trying to talk about because it both is used to designate something that you think you can identify like a, a fact or a thing, but if you think of the ing part of it, the present participle part of it, then suddenly it becomes a process, being. So there's a tension in the word between uh, uh, being and being, if you will. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think that is what one of the things he's trying to, 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 pro to problematize there. So in a certain sense, the, 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 the poverty of English, that we don't have this, this, this difference in the same way, could turn out to be a, a possibility of, of maybe arguing that this is maybe what he's really talking about. Uh, uh, there, but then you see, you wouldn't have two totally different words necessarily to separate uh, to separate it. Uh, the problem is he does use two terms, but then he keeps saying, "No, but you have to be very careful not to think that you can separate these things. You have to distinguish them." And entities, that beings as entities, don't can't be reduced or used as a model for thinking being. But later on, he then you know he then uh, moves away from this notion of being with a capital B or Zion and so on, and then introduces the notion of event, and the event is something that sort of breaks out, that's unpredictable, that 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 is historical, in that sense, and uh, and uh, in any case, it's something I think that it's related to what we've just been reading with Derrida. When Derrida says, um, if you look closely at a fact, in order for a fact to be a mark it has to be understood as a leftover. It has to be understood as an epiphenomenon somehow. It, 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 it's the result of a process. It isn't simply self-identical. And it's the result of a process that, it, that implies other things and, and a, a relation to difference and, and, and so on. So I think, in other words, I think Derrida is carrying this thought of what Heidegger calls ontological difference at a certain point uh, into, into linguistic processes, which Heidegger also does later on as well, after being, I mean, after being in time. As a matter of fact, um, when he works in on Hölderlin, he uses another in, 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 uh, infinitive that he gets from Hölderlin, which is the word sagen, which normally would be translated as saying. And, uh, but it also, it, as, a, as a noun, it's like saga. It's also the word saga, a kind of myth. And, and um, uh, this word saying is, becomes then a way of describing a certain type of linguistic articulation of, of, of what, what before was called ontological difference, you see. So again, there again, we get the, the infinitive in German, the ing ending when you try to render that into, into English, and, uh, uh, but this time carried onto the, the process of enunciation. I, I, I tend to see that, uh, those of you who know Lacan, <coughs> it would be Lacan's emphasis on enunciation as opposed to enoncé, that sort of correspond, the process of enunciating as opposed to the, the, the actual uh, finished element of an, of an enunciation. Enunciating as opposed to enunciation. Mm -hmm. See, it all, uh, I, don't, I don't think it matters that much what it's called, but I think that the pattern recurs there, signifying as opposed to signifying. The important thing is to realize that there's a structural difference between uh, the present participle even if it's substantivized as gerund on the one hand, and the past participle, uh, such as signified. The one is suggested is completed, it's already taking place, it's there, and it's in some sense self-identical. Self and the other is ongoing. And I believe what's very suggestive to me is that it implies a simultaneity with the process of enunciation. You see, as I mentioned before. And the only other, the other point I wanted to mention that I haven't mentioned yet is that this is also uh, Jacobson's, Roman Jacobson's uh, description of the eye as shifter. The eye, there, he, uh, Jacobson says that the, the, uh, the only ling firm significance you can have of an eye is that it refers to the speaker of the Annunciation. In that sense, it's sort of intralinguistic. But the interesting thing from, let's say, from a Derridian point of view would be, what does it mean that the eye refers to the Annunciation? 
what 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 is that relationship between them? You see that what is the relation? Does the I control it, or is the I a function of the uh, what is being um, enun enunciated there? And uh, um, I think you know Derrida would I think would argue for the latter. Um, he says, like, uh, and that, uh, and that. Um, I don't want to lose my train of thought here. Um, and that, therefore, the the, the <coughs> I is not constitutive. It's not the author of of the statement, but that it is part of the statement. It's a uh, it's something that is defined with uh, with respect to the uh, uh, to the to the statement. And. Uh, the point, I guess, I, that I'm trying to articulate here, bumbling about, is uh, that um, what we would normally call the simultaneity, let's say, you know, I only say I am I, I singing if I am singing at that time or speaking, as opposed to I speak. You know, I speak German, but I am speaking English, right? Not I speak, I speak English in general, but I'm speaking in, in English to you. Now, what is implied in the temporality of that relationship, of that difference? You see, that it allows me to, when I say I. And uh, uh, there, uh, uh, um, the notion of simultaneity, uh, from a Derridian point of view, I believe, would be taken as a, a differential relationship, not a, uh, not a, uh, not a uh, one of absolute unity. See, there's the, uh, something is the same time as, but the time is split. The, the, there is no, in other words, there's no convergence. Maybe that's the way. This way, there's no absolute convergence between the I and the statement that defines the referent point of the I. I is the the the, the person speaking, uh, but uh, although they're inseparable, they're not mergeable. They're not identifiable. <coughs> so so the, 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 there's a tension that then. And uh, uh, it's very interesting, this tension between the, the first person there uh, in, in, uh, uh, has a lot to do with the uncanny and many other things. Uh, in German, uh, although Freud begins his essay by saying the uncanny describes an effective state, you know, uh, the way it's usually expressed in the examples he gives and, 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 and uh, is that... Uh, it, it uses what's called in Latin and other the, the the dative of reference. The dative of reference is like mihi in Latin. It's to me, and uh, what you you wouldn't say, I feel uncanny, you know, or I, or you wouldn't you can't say I am uncanny. You can say I'm anxious or I'm afraid. You can't say I'm uncanny, I, or uh, <laughs> in that way. So the un, the uncanniness, although it describes an affect or some a situation implying an affect is separate both from subject and object. It's not a property, a pure property of an objective, because it does refer to a subject. To a, but it isn't the property of the subject either as a normal feeling. And that's what makes it so, uh, you know, so difficult. That's, what, that, that's one of the things that Freud struggles with in the essay. I think the most crucial thing is to try to pin down the relation of anxiety, uh, which is uh, an affect, in a, and uh, the uncanny, which involves anxiety uh, and, and, and fear, but isn't reducible to it. That's why you can just... And, and so in that essay, what he's trying to do is to say, you know, what are the objective properties that, that, that describe uncanny? And he, he can never pin it down as an obje fully objective, because any, any set of examples he gives, you can give counterexamples uh, which, which are not uncanny. And that, that constantly you know, upsets his sort of argument, and he has to keep looking. And it's also not simply... Uh, a feeling, although it's, it's inseparable from a, a feeling of anxiety. So, and that's what makes it both difficult and very interesting to, uh, in, in talking about it uh, there, because you can't really, you can't situate it in terms of a clear-cut opposition of subject and object. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at the very end, he comes up with a very interesting thing that it depends on the, the point of view of the, in fiction particularly, it would depend on the point of view of the reader. In other words, you can't say that chopped off arms and so on are per se uncanny. In a certain situation, when the reader identifies with a certain thing, then it can have an uncanny effect. You see. So there you get again, once at the end, you get through the notion of identification there, a kind of involvement and, and, and interaction of subject and object, 
but it's not on the one or the, or, 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 or the other side. And uh, the other point there, which is interesting both in all of these contexts, is when you use a date of a reference, the uncanny uh, is something that comes to, arrives to, comes over the subject, but doesn't, is never the property of the subject, doesn't emanate from the subject, you see. Uh, so it is related to something that looks like an objective condition or an experience or an encounter. But it is, and, and that's also the way I mentioned uh, yesterday, I think, uh, the way uh, a German up to a certain point described dreaming. You know, it dreamt me, you can say. And you can say the same thing for the uncanny. It is to me uncanny. That's the way it uh, used to be de uh, <coughs> described. Not I feel uncanny or it is and so on. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, in other words, uh, this is a, yet another example of, a, of, of an experience that tends to break down the kind of oppositional logic that Nietzsche in uh, Beyond Good and Evil, for instance, is, is you know is, is, question, is questioning there. So would it be more accurate to say then something like I am? I what? I am. Like if I'm doing something, I'm I am. You know what I mean? Because you know the thing you were going you were saying before was in Derrida that he said uh, when the, the subject speaks, it is a right? process yeah, yeah, yeah. of, sort of the, is the thing that he speaks is also acting on him as well as the so then you know I am speaking. I don't yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting question, but I don't think I don't think I mean first of all uh, the fact that it that it doesn't exist in English I don't know if that, that's not an argument one way or the other presumably, but um, I think there's a tension between the I the use of the word I which does nevertheless imply some sort of consistency <coughs> some sort of organization and the sort of the the intrinsic openness of the I and ongoingness of the ing. So, so I don't think you can say. That's why I think it's so violent to say something like "ing" or "meing" or, 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 or. Although you know, when you go back and I, I didn't emphasize it, but if you go back and read that second meditation of Descartes, he says at a certain point, uh, uh, "How long can I be, I be certain that I exist? Only as long as I think that I am thinking. Only as long." So, in a certain sense, it's not cogito ergo sum. It has to be. Uh, cogitando me cogitans or something like that. I am thinking that I am, that I am thinking or something like that. You know, it has to be, but the I does, I think, imply some sort of minimal degree of organization. That's why I find, you know, Freud's, it's called second typology there, uh, of superego, ego, and, 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 and id, suggestive. Because he, he does say the I has the, 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 the function of trying to organize uh, uh, these conflicting elements, but that it can never, you know, it, it can never fully accomplish that. You see, so and, and the I is in a position of sort of receiving messages and responding and 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 and, and, and the thing, uh, things like that. So, so uh, in other words, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't <laughs> that's not me. Uh, uh, yeah, that'll be next, you know, the uh, uh, power of suggestion. That was uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so 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 that's uh, you know that, uh, that that would be my answer. I think it's a you know a very legitimate question, but I don't want to give up that minimal degree of you know. Can, whatever it is, consistency, organization. Uh, just as Derrida at a certain point says, um, Searle accuses me of wanting to dispense with it, to disqualify intention. I don't want to disqualify intention. I want to rethink its, its function. And that's what I'm doing, with the, I'm doing with the unconscious when I say that the unconscious seems to me to be a structurally multi-intentional, an, an ununifiable multi-intentionality. It is an intentional kind of thinking, Otherwise, repression could never be done. It aims at something, it excludes it, something is replaced. It's a, it is a teleological kind of thinking, but it's a, a multiple of the sort that can't be unified, and that's what makes it ultimately structurally incompatible with... Uh, and all the other you know, sexual aspects of it and content are important, but they're important because of the threat that, it po that, that they pose to a certain culturally and otherwise established notion of identity, of, of, of ego identity. That, that, that I think is the key. Uh
at least an important point. Any any uh, other sort of remarks on any of uh, I say I think this is uh, uh, as far as I could tell if there were one you know one point where I'd say you know we're not an Archimedean point of, of Derrida's writing but something that does keep coming back and allows you to to to, to, to recognize a certain gestures that he keeps making uh, this would be it this would be, you know I started out early on by talking about my uh, uh, the, uh, experiences with Adorno and the Frankfurt School. And I see this as a continuation of that. You see, but it's, it's an effort to problematize the identity of the self, both subjective, objective, and, and, and as a political, economic or organization, the notion of property is very, proper and property is, is very important there. The kind of a, a notion of property has to be relativized, can't be made absolute, depends on the improper, on that which can never be fully uh, um, uh, appropriated. So it has a, a political, uh, um, a thrust to it, and I see that as, as therefore, as somewhat parallel. But I see Derrida taking that into a domain more involved in, in linguistic signification, which allow with, with which I can work more productively than with the conceptual uh, uh, scheme of Adorno. See, so I, I don't feel as if this is a you know a uh, in any sense a, a betrayal of that, mm -hmm. uh, but rather trying to, to to sort of follow that through. Mm -hmm. Sort of, there are all ways of thinking the other, trying to problematize a kind of narcissistic uh, tendency of Western thinking that is manifest in lots of ways, but also in its rational structures as well. Which doesn't mean you become irrational, but it means those rational structures are rethought. I don't think anybody who reads Derrida seriously can sort of see him as arguing with some sort of irrationality in any in any in any sense. There, see? it's it's sort of like. Uh, when you're reading something, Freud describes in the, in the interpretation of dreams how uh, when you read often, uh, you don't notice, or I think, it's in the, sorry, I think it's in the psychopathology of everyday life, you'll skip over errors. You won't notice errors uh, in a text. You don't want to be you know, held up in your... In your and and uh, that's a little bit the model, a certain model for rationality. Certain, a rationality that is absolutely insistent on things being clear and, and co consistent we won't even see or won't take into consideration or won't allow you to dwell on anything that, that, that doesn't fit in there. We'll devalorize it, won't see it, we'll think it's a waste of time, won't support it, we'll disqualify it, etc. And what people like Freud, Derrida, and others <coughs> you know, seem to be are doing are to valorize that. Say hey, well, that's where things are happening. It's like when Freud says, uh, when when uh, an analyzant is describing a dream and it, and he, he or she is telling a story, and at a certain point they'll say, here there's a dark place, or here's something I don't remember. That's where, where you you know you want as an analyst you want to keep your eye open and try to you know bring the discussion back to that 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 interruption there. You see. You see, it's all the same pattern, the exception, the marginalization, the, the, the whatever is excluded is not excluded for no reason. You see that? The, uh, and, and very often those reasons are, 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 are crucial, it can be very illuminating. So. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about something, I don't know if it's too much uh, tangential, mm -hmm. but um, in, in the rules, the notion of becoming, the idea of becoming and then of difference and repetition is completely yeah. different, and the uncanny seems to not have the same priority, at least yeah. in the writing. How do you evaluate the way in which he is interested in becoming in, in this one? Are they related at all? In, in Deleuze? Yeah, because it's com it seems to be completely towards another. Uh, Deleuze is a real uh, is a real enigma for me. Not that I don't understand individual. I, I taught, for example, difference in repetition several times, and I I really uh, could never get to a reading of it where I felt I was could do any, I could do anything interesting with it. Mm. Either because I wasn't really understanding it, or, or not understanding it in a way. As it's been a while, I haven't you know gone back to it. We, at the same time, I constantly have students who are very enthusiastic and, and interested in Deleuze, and you know, and, and I obviously respect his, uh, his work, what I've read of it enormously. I haven't read all of that because of all kinds of. Apparently, Deleuze also in the Logique de Sens mm -hmm. talks about the present participle. 
I've been told I haven't had a chance really to, to, mm -hmm. to you know, to, to, to check check that out. But I, it, my basic, my so basic logic, you're saying logic of sense, huh? yeah, logic, logic of sense, sense. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. My, 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 uh, what interests me with a writer like Derrida that I don't find in almost any other uh, French writer, with the exception, well, uh, of the famous post-structuralists, with the partial exception of Lacan, is that the writing process itself is is part of what is going on. It seems to me, when I read Deleuze or Foucault, it seems to me they have a very, very traditional sort of spectator position in their discourse. It's, and maybe that's one reason why Foucault was acceptable in lots of ways that Derrida wasn't. You know that, that. And I would also say that to some extent with Deleuze, although I haven't read all of Deleuze by any means, you know, not, uh, I read slowly, it takes time, blah, 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 and so on. So there's all kind of, you know, if you don't, if you don't feel like you're making progress, you go and read something else. And that doesn't mean, so I don't, you know, I don't feel that I uh, am either in a position to say anything. If somebody comes to speak and says, I want to work on the lyrics, I say, great, maybe that would be a chance for me to find a way, you know, into it and so on. Uh, I started out reading, for example, a uh, very early Deleuze, Proust et les Cines, mm -hmm. which I thought was terrific, you know, but it's a different, you know, there, he had a text of Proust, and it was very illuminating to me the way he was reading that, that text. I saw all kinds of things in Proust that I hadn't seen you know, before uh, there. It seemed to me really uh, fantastic. And then uh, uh, I read him on Nietzsche and found him much less interesting, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then uh, worked a couple of, you know, times on, on difference and repetition, because those are two, you know, the, uh, actually Jean-Luc Nancy is the person who tried desperately to bring Deleuze and Derrida into some sort of dialogue. Here there are these two, you know, marginalized figures in some sense who, uh, uh, and uh, uh, both of them, in a way, victimized of a certain really traditional French philosophical establishment. Both talking about difference, repetition, uh, you know, very similar uh, things, and yet they're ne not really interacting with, uh, uh, with one another. And Nancy actually, uh, I think he had arranged, uh, uh, before Deleuze's death, he had arranged some sort of discussion that you know, uh, was cut short by, by Deleuze's uh, uh, death. And then he actually wrote a piece on it, tried to reconstruct, uh, not reconstruct, but to imagine what might have, you know, <laughs> what they, why, why there was no communication between the two of them, whereas it seemed so much, mm -hmm. so on. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't know Deleuze nearly well enough to, be, to say anything about that, but I, what I sense, and what's very important to me, is that the writing process be done in such a way that it is a part of what's being written about. You see, that, that, does, that is what goes on in literature in some sense. It isn't what goes on with, in literary criticism that often, but I think it should, you know, and so on. And it is what goes on with Derrida and to some extent with Lacan. You know, beyond Lacan's flamboyance and difficulty, there really is a, an uh, a theatrical <coughs> sense of performance that I think is very, very, you know, Im 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 important. So that uh, uh, the, it seems to me that uh, I have a hard time uh, following certain moves of Deleuze precisely because it seems to me that the writing process uh, remains very conventionally exterior to what it is that's being written about. And that, that see, I take, take the writing process at, in the sense of this repetitive iterability. You know, you are, re in writing about something, you are reworking it, repeating and, stuff, and transforming it, but you're a part of that. <coughs> you're involved in that. You have to sort of take responsibility for that. And, uh, and so I, I see it, as, as I say, extending in both directions toward the, the past in terms of responding to and toward the future in terms of, 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 of trying to evoke responses of future readers and listeners. And, and you're sort of a, a, a delimit, you know, you're a point of in between those two there in the process of writing. And uh, um, uh, so this means that a certain type of propositional statement is going to have to be relativized. You know, you won't find propositional statements in, uh, in Derrida in the same way that you find them in, I mean, in Foucault you have a whole pathos of history. You know, this is one of the big uh, elements, you know, that Foucault is, you know, argues that he is really going back to a history that's out there and he's, you know, rethinking it and so on, certainly, but that the history is there and his intervention in it is in some sense secondary. You know, he's, <coughs> he's telling you the truth of what was being done. This is my sense. Again, I haven't read all of that Foucault either and so on. Um, 
this is also, by the way, I'll, I'll add my problem with the Gamba. <coughs> you see, and uh, there's also a tremendous um, tension between a Gamba and, and Derrida that I don't understand. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the source of it is because in many ways a Gamba uh, is very close or sh came out of a very similar type of thing. At a certain point, you get extremely polemical statements and then Derrida responds. Uh, I think, but as far as I know, I think Agamben starts it, and uh, and very very weird and unjustified uh, uh, things going on, unproductive above all. You know, it's not a question of justification. That who cares about that? Uh, they can each take care of themselves. That's not the, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but uh, it's unproductive. Nothing. That's not a productive encounter, as far as I can tell. And there, see, there too. Uh, you get a rhetorical gesture very often in Giorgio Agamben's work that, again, for me, is very conventional uh, in terms of, of, of an academic kind of distance between what you're writing and writing. So this is what I, you know, this is my particular take, what I find congenial, what I find important, is to acknowledge uh, the way in which one's writing <coughs> is, in some sense, caught up in this problem of iterability and it both involved in and responsible for the text. And that means that any, any sort of propositional statements, conclusions you might come to are going to be in one way or another tentative, provocative, uh, perhaps with this uh, with a, a term perhaps, or uh, suppose that, or hypothetical, in some sense, open to revision. Mm -hmm. Because there's no position I can see that, that a writer would have <coughs> that would allow for the kind of certainty that is usually expected from, you know, uh, uh, cognitive statements of that sort. You see, uh, that, that's my, you know, my. Uh, but that's not, you know, so it's not a specific answer. There's a sort of a general. Uh, uh, so that they're, they're, you know, they're. It's very clear. I mean, it has, it has also to do with there is part of the. You know, you're also saying that there's part of the method by which you would understand actually what's being compared is not there. Part of the methodology that they would have used right. to 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 express it while understanding it. I mean, I suppose, you know, that if pressed, the response to Derrida would be, this kind of involvement is narcissistic. You know, he is playing games and so on. He's not respectful enough before the, the otherness of the text or something by suggesting that, you know, that every interpretation or every reading in some way is co-constitutive of, of, of what it's writing about. You know, I can see, I think that that would be one... Uh, 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 as far as that goes, it seems to me the test of respect is it can only be done in the reading of the of, or the examination of what's being talked about. If you have if you if you have the feeling that the, the reading opens up things in a text for you that you haven't seen before, then it is you know it is uh, 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 valid and justified. If you have the reading that's imposing something from without that really doesn't help you, it doesn't isn't relevant to that, then it is narcissistic. In that. In, in, uh, in that sense. But it's not a question of sort of reproducing something that is somehow in the text, ultimately as the authorial m mindset or, in, or, or intention to that, uh, or in, in whatever you're dealing <coughs> with. And, and this is so, this is uh, one of the big debates in academia then has to do with the status of history. Because history would be the collective name that could be assigned to this idea of collective authorial intention that invests texts and, and, and practices with an internal meaning. That is history. See, mm -hmm. For many people. Not for me, not for Derrida, not for Heidegger. Not, not in the Heideggerian post -Heidegger. And that is what, uh, it, it seems to me that that is one of the main separation points in contemporary thinking is the conception of history uh, and how it relates to this question of imminence, intentionality, and, and, and so on. So at the academic level, you have people valorizing Foucault because he, he deals with, you know, he's very erudite and, those, and, and you know, says, you know, in the 17th century you have this happening and then the 18th century this is happening and, uh, and analyzes this and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and is modest. <coughs> not, you know, ultimately not, but, you, you know, modest in the sense that the, the value of the, his text is measured on the value of what he's unearthing in what's really happened, what really is out there. But writers like Heidegger, Benjamin, Derrida, Benjamin, you know, have a different notion of history. Uh, 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 what I was calling an interactive notion of history by which the interaction, think of it in this context, it's not in between, it's within. Mm 
not like you have some, you do have texts out there, but the functioning of those texts out there, the way they establish any sort of meaningful functioning already then is involves what he's talking about with the mark, with the, 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 the rereading, you see. So that, so that what the, from that point of view, the objectification of history is merely a, a, a fetishization of an established set of readings of history. And that is Nietzschean, I think. I, so I think Derrida is very much in a Nietzschean, more so, I would, interesting enough, I, I, I would argue more so than Foucault, although Foucault has written very well on Nietzsche, you know, in, in lots of areas. And with all of the talk of power that you have you know, in, in Foucault, uh, for me, the missing link there is the power of writing, of, his, you know, of, of, of the, the written intervention. You know, is, uh, isn't his written intervention in theorizing power in certain ways, disciplines, so on, isn't that a co-constitutive uh, move rather than a kind of neutral reproductive move, sort of move, you see? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, what, I was going to, what I was going to say is it does seem to me there from this point of view a sort of a division in, in, in modern thinking that is 19th, 20th, 21st century where you have a sort of a dividing line uh, that runs by uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, uh, uh, Heidegger, Freud, um, uh, Derrida, uh, Benjamin, I would put Benjamin in this category, and then another one which is more objectivistic and which you know, wants to retain the idea of a self-contained object so that the, 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 the written interpretation really is modest only in reproducing that. But you see, if the written interpretation is actually projecting its own thing, then it's extremely immodest, so it can work both ways. But it seems that it's more more humble, you know, and it can take the form of being more humble. Whereas, for example, uh, uh, Derrida uh, takes great pleasure in including the theatrical conditions under which papers are given, delivered, circulated, in uh, in the way he composes his his his, 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 his uh, text, particularly later on, the later text. Now, is this you know diversionary? Is this trivial? Or is this important? Is it considered? It really, uh, uh, there were serious, you know, choices to be made there. It seems to me. So, so that's the way I would see the the. Uh, you, you may not get that so much uh, about Heidegger or even Benjamin reading the English translations of them, but uh, if you do read the German, I think that there is a lot of that in uh, uh, as well in there. Uh, so that, for example, the, the, the post-Heideggerian notion of history as event is really not the unfolding of a continual meaning or even its transformation, but a kind of uh, eruption of, uh, of the unexpected, of uh, uh, the disruptive, and, and, and so on. So, you know, if that's the case, then it's a very different type of history that you're, you're dealing with. It doesn't have the same kind of kind of, 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 uh, of appeal, maybe for some, that the, the traditional notion of history as a kind of progress or uh, would have. Is that at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think no, it is, it's yeah. You're kind of saying that, you know, even in the action of the <coughs> historical text, you are, in a sense, historicizing it. You are creating the history simply by referring to the text. Yeah, but the question is, what do you mean by history? I agree. Yeah, I mean, you are, but I mean, but in in what way are you? I would say you're you're, you're co-creating it. In other words, you're not just you're not just producing something that is totally independent, but you're, you're interacting with something that is both other and, in some sense, uh, 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 sufficiently close to you to allow you to interact with it. And out of that comes something something unexpected in a way. Uh, in other words, a kind of transformation, it need, uh, which, which could be a transformation of, of, I think that this is something that Foucault and, and, and Deleuze also uh, certainly wanted and, and, and would include. In, the, in other words, um, a transformation of established relations of forces, certainly Foucault in the obvious ways, intervention with prisons and uh, the whole idea of disciplinary power and so on. And, and then bi biopolitics is more complicated. I mean, Foucault, as far as I know, didn't introduce the notion of biopolitics primarily in a critical sense. It became critical for Agamben, 
uh, and so on. And Agamben also changed the whole focus very much. But for Foucault, it was more, uh, you know, sort of a description of a, of a shift in, in politics from traditional notions of sovereignty to notions of management of populations, you see. And it wasn't per se uh, introduced in his lectures in the Collège de France as a critical, uh, which you really, you know, I don't think you can say, well, it depends. I'm not sure. Again, I don't know. I think in the case of the panopticum, it, you know, it seems to have a very critical thrust to it. Bentham and then you know, Foucault getting involved in prisons and so on. In in a, a Foucault book that I, one of the early ones again that I really think is terrific, the the birth of the clinic. There again, I don't think it's critical uh, so much. I think it's trying to to map a, a real shift in the way uh, uh, reality is perceived and so on and experienced through the development of what's called clinical inspection and so on of uh, the you know the birth of the birth of the clinic there. So. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Deleuze and Foucault, as well as Derrida, uh, all hoped, in a way, to intervene in history or to have a sense of history as 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 possible transformation. But again, it, it's in the evaluation of the particular writing process and everything connected with writing, writing, reading, uh, listening, uh, deciphering, and so on. Uh, and it's there that the valorizations really, uh, uh, it seems to me, split apart. Uh, as far as I can, you know, uh, as far as I can see, right? Uh, so that would be, for me, uh, a very strong Nietzschean element in Derrida, in as much as Nietzsche is very, very attentive to the functioning of language. You know? But you can read Nietzsche and not worry about that. You can read Nietzsche in terms of will to power and lots of other things, and not, you know, uh, not particularly emphasize his whole relationship to language. Uh, truth and lies and the the early stuff and so on. And so there are different ways, there are different, and there are different aspects of Nietzsche. Nietzsche, the, I already mentioned, the, 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 the name Nietzsche is not a guarantee of homogeneity or of, 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 of uniformity. There are different ways of reading Nietzsche. You know. But it explains why, for example, uh, and I think I don't think it's a, it's a put-down, but some people would, why Derrida was uh, uh, sort of intuitively well-received in literary critical circles, let's say. Uh, very early on, because this, the, the kinds of things he was doing with language and, and reading and writing were in some ways close to what people do in, 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 in interpreting literature. So they, you know, those kind of, uh, it wasn't so unfamiliar, but he was then putting it in a huge, you know, much larger context than any critic had ever done before. Yeah. Any, any other sort of... Uh, Things you'd like to talk about in connection with this, uh, or anything else, by the way, since this is our, you know, this is our last. Uh, feel free to, you know, anything that's come up in the past uh, few days, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, is is fair game. Have you read a whole of any Deland at all? Not, not very much. No. Because it's interesting that he sort of has the same tension that you have in terms of um, the ontology against essences, um, because it's sort of uh, a lot of his sort of he. he really focused on Deleuze, but he sort of takes it to a place where um, rather than have essences of any kind, you have only processes, mm -hmm. and you have only sort of the underlying reasons from which you can sort of, you can pick out essences and say this is such sure. and this is such and this is such, right. but it's, there's not actually those per se, it's actually a process which, right. which creates them. You see, uh, for me the nitty gritty though then becomes in, in seeing the relation of that to the functioning of language, uh, and how do nouns work? What does it mean when you name properly? How does syntax work? What does grammar tell us? And so on. You see, uh, it's, uh, you, if you abstract from that, for me, you're abstracting from an absolutely essential uh, dimension there. That's the only, uh, you know, that, that would be my, my uh, uh, that's my difference, I don't know. You know I guess though, the, the, the thing that I've noticed is that I've sort of been keeping that in mind as I've been listening to you speak, and I've noticed that in a lot of the things that you say, there's sort of, there is the, the, the notion of against essences, but then also at the same time, you, you refer to quite a, like a number of blank is blank is blank is blank is blank is blank. And it's just, I understand, I, mean, I think the, the big problem is that uh, it's sort of, it is ingrained in the language that you have to define nouns and essences. Absolutely. Um, and I guess, you know, other than totally shifting the language and trying to create one which is based entirely on becoming, um, which would get really complicated really quickly, um, I don't really... If, if you look at, at, at a lot of Derrida's text, you can analyze it precisely as a way of trying to develop a way of writing, speaking, 
communicating in which these things are uh, as much as is possible because you can't do it absolutely you know brought into into play uh, made fluid you see absolutely uh, you're absolutely right uh, you know th 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 see this is what Adorno got hung up on with his notion of the non-conceptual the non-identical you know some sort of absolute other Derrida's formula for example of the relation to the other very hard to translate <coughs> in French is tout autre et tout autre it's, it sounds like a tot tautology every other is every other except that uh, uh, in, in French the autre can be a noun but it can also be an, an, an adjective or an adverb so it could be every other is always otherwise or something like that that is not itself you see and uh, you see the, the search for ways of speaking and ways of writing that uh, bring out these ambiguities that, that function with ambiguities is, 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 is crucial to this. Now, in the kind of discourse that we have here, that I can do very little of that. I'm not in a, a dairy doctor could do a lot more, even in speaking, but then it made it sometimes very enigmatic what he was saying. You know, you'd hear him saying things, that, wait a minute, you know, what does that mean? When you're writing, I can do a little bit more of this. If you see some of the stuff that I write, I try, uh, it also makes it hard in some ways to translate the stuff that I, you know, uh, uh, and so on. And, and, uh, um, so, you know, you're, at, you're right. Uh, uh, in a certain discourse, it's very hard. What I'm trying to do here is paradoxical. It's in, in a language, uh, in a traditional language, to set up uh, problems that ultimately imply a non-traditional use of language, you see. And I do try to do that when I write. It, it's hard to do it in a, in a you know... Uh, and I try, to, I try to do it when I read, by pointing to, you know, nuances... In, in, yeah. in words that you could you know, easily over, overlook or that the translators over, you know, don't worry about and so on there. So uh, a kind of practice of ambiguity, not just any ambiguity, that's the point. I mean, that's, it has to be, they have to be really uh, uh, important ambiguities. You know, otherwise it becomes a kind of easy and empty uh, exercise. That, it shouldn't be that, you see. Sometimes people take it as that, but that, that then suddenly starts to look like American advertising. The American advertising is great with you know word plays and so on. There's no you know, so it's not it, uh, there are word plays and there are word plays. So with like a detailed reading like that, what do you think about misinterpret misinterpretation of like an orthographical error? Uh, um, very good. It's a good point. If you can, if you can, well, misinterpretation of it. I know what you mean. If you. If, if you see an orthographical error, for example, I see it sometimes in student papers or myself, mm -hmm. my initial immediate tendency would be to look for some sort of meaning behind it. Okay. Now, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but I, you know, I don't dispense with it as being it's just an error. Yeah. You know, so and maybe I won't find it. Maybe it could be trivial. It could not be interesting. Exactly. Not all not all errors are interesting. Yeah. Not all Freudian slips are. You know, they may be interesting for the person who makes them. I mean. Not in the sense that they want to know it. You don't want to know about it, but it may tell you something about, mm -hmm. you know, what you're thinking about and not thinking about. But that doesn't mean it interests other people. So mm -hmm. it's different when you're dealing in a kind of a public domain. They have to, these, they have to be, they have to be public conventions that are brought into play, maybe unintentionally through errors. Mm -hmm. You see, and that gets interesting then. So mm -hmm. it really, you know, you you uh, you you uh, uh, you know. Um, Adorno once said that um, for, his Freudian slips or mistake are the means through which the incommunicable gets communicated. Well, the typical kind of Adorno, you know, aphorism and so on. So, you know, I think one always does well to be alert, not just, you know, gloss over it. At the same time, first of all, don't harp, the, you shouldn't interpret other people's slips because, you know, they don't need it from you. Uh, you can do it yourself, and you can keep, but keep it to yourself. Don't go uh, playing, you know, uh, un undesired analyst to other people. That, that, that's just a kind of power game. You know, I know what you're doing, and uh, uh, that I would be very, you know, discourage you to do it uh, from doing. But if you see, you know, you see things. I mean, for example, in the poet I'm working with now, Hölderling, it's not just a question of slips, it's a question of a lot of his poetry uh, uh, was never published. And it, it occurs in all kinds of different versions, so that you don't even know, uh, there's no way of your knowing uh, a priori what version to privilege or what. So usually you would say, 
well, uh, the poet, you know, decided on this, and that's what he published, and that's what we, that becomes our authority, and so on. Even that is, uh, is, is not absolute, I would say. If, you know, if you can find interesting variations that for some reason a poet didn't publish, let's say, you should think about them. You know, you, there's nothing a priori to exclude it, but you have to make an interesting case why that is, you know, why that should interest people. Uh, but in the case of Italy, the very text of his poems often is, is, is totally uh, up in the air. You have some people taking variations and making different poems out of them, different versions of the same poem. And other people say, no, this is just a fragment of a poem that he wrote down and then tried to rewrite. And so, so it, it, it's a very interesting situation for an interpreter to be in because it puts a lot of responsibility on it. It isn't just like, hey, you can do anything, but it does put a responsibility on you that I think the interpreter has anyway. In other words, in the case of Henry James, he wrote, he wrote a lot of his novels late in life. And you have a whole different, you know, much longer, some ways heavier kind of text. Some people prefer the later ones, some people prefer the early ones, some people uh, talk about the, inter, you know, the, the difference between them. There's no absolute a priori. The fact that he decided at some point in his life to rewrite his own novels in a certain way, uh, from a certain point of view, that would be absolutely authoritative. You have to respect the, the, you know, the will of the, of the author. But from another point of view, uh, as soon as you have this idea that uh, a self-consciousness is responding to contradictory uh, uh, demands and is trying to mediate between them, then the fact that somebody later you know, does one version, earlier does another version, uh, is totally open. And in the Western tradition, you have uh, uh, sort of a con uh, contradictory conventions. One says the earliest is closest to the origin is better, and the other says the later is closest to the maturity is better. You know, you can you can see either way. You know, the the, the final revision is the is the and uh, so it's, even the conventions are not you know uniform uh, there. So, uh, but it seems to me that uh, the interesting thing there is that the reader should try as much as possible to take responsibility for the way in which you read. You see, with, without without simply imposing what you already know on a text, because that's you don't need to, to read a text for that reason, or without you know totally uh, allow you know thinking that you're receiving some uh, message that has nothing to do with anything that you. Uh, have you know ever worked on or thought about and so on because you're inevitably filtering and seeing and so on any message you receive is one that you're you know you're willing to receive and able to receive and and, and so on so you're in between that kind of you know it's not a it's not an either or situation but an either action it seems to me okay. yeah the, the, and probably the same with other you know with art visual arts and, and I would think at least yeah. but you see anybody who says uh, we need an absolutely objectifiable uh, uh, standard criterion to make value judgments. We'll be very unhappy with that with that situation. See, mm -hmm. That's that's one of the issues that go. The, you know, they the, the say that's just total relativism, arbitrary, uh, so on. You know, and uh, uh, um, and, and uh, that's what. So we have we have a text, and the text uh, is fixed, and. Uh, it has a meaning, and uh, the critic should try to be, you know, the spokesman of the text, and so on. Uh, 